to traditionally fit uh, older patterns that we're all accustomed to, and you know that as well as I. And until recently, uh, they seldom addressed outcomes or the results you were looking for. You would have said you were doing that, but essentially you really didn't do it. And then primarily in response to external demands in recent years, uh, curricula have had some attention. Uh, in the United States, uh, some of that demand has come from government, some of that demand has come from accrediting associations, but it brought new pressure on educational institutions to give serious attention to the kinds of results which they expected as, as a consequence of the, of the academic program. Now, in some instances, uh, there were changes that were brought about by a desire to accommodate new vocations. I can recall, for example, when uh, almost entirely uh, theological schools were oriented around preparing people for pastoral ministry. And so you had the Bachelor of Divinity, the Master of Divinity degrees, and you expected people who complete the program generally to become pastors or missionaries. If they were going to be involved in teaching, they went on to do THMs and so on. But in recent years, uh, there was an awareness that if you were going to move into certain vocational callings, then the curriculum in which you were engaged at the theological school probably needed to be adjusted for that specialization. And so you had degree programs that concentrated on education for Christian educators in churches and in Christian organizations. Uh, you had missions programs or majors. Uh, you had counseling programs or majors and so on. And so there was a proliferation of degree programs in, in regard to this realization that different vocations required different kinds of specialization and specialized training. Sometimes uh, the effort was simply to remedy deficiencies. And I happen to have been involved in a couple of those experiences where there were external concerns that the graduates of certain institutions were deficient in several categories. And as a matter of fact, sometimes the graduates themselves expressed a concern about deficiencies. And in order to address those, uh, the institution then would decide that some kind of curricular revision was necessary. Now, uh, if you want to revise a curriculum or shape any curriculum in a theological school or an academic institution, it seems to me the place to begin is by acknowledging that unless you know the purpose and unless you know the desired results of that curriculum, any effort to shape it is probably not going to produce the results you're looking for, or at least it won't maximize those results. And so this is where you begin. With the purpose. And you ask yourself, what's the purpose of the curriculum of your institution? Do you really know exactly what you're trying to accomplish? Why do you have this curriculum? Why is it being implemented? And what are the desired outcomes or results that you're looking for? And are these clear, measurable, and accurate? How comprehensive are these outcomes? And have you asked yourself whether or not you may be overlooking important areas of need? You can go beyond that to ask yourself, are you sure that the curriculum you have implemented or that you want to revise is going to produce satisfactory results? 
typically we assume that's going to be the case. And we say, here are the things we're teaching. We know this is going to be what happens as a result. But it doesn't always happen. And that's why often we see deficiencies in terms of graduates or external demands for change. So you say, how, how do you know how do you know that you can get certain results? How will you be able to measure or demonstrate an improvement of the type you desire? And we'll get to that in just a minute, but essentially, it's unless you can find some way to measure, some way to examine the results of what you're doing with your academic program, you're not going to be able to do that. You'll be guessing. Uh, you may recall the phrase from Alice in Wonderland where Alice is asking the cat as she comes to a fork in the road, she says, which fork should I take? Are you familiar with that? And the cat asks her, he says, well, uh, where do you want to go? And she says, well, I'm not sure. He says, well, then either fork will do. It won't matter which way you go if you don't know what you're destination is. That's essentially, I think that's where we begin here today, saying unless you really have a very specific understanding of your objectives and what you're trying to accomplish, uh, then you may be surprised by the results. Another thing is that seems to me admission standards probably should be included as a factor here. You say, why, why in the world would you do that? Because if you're looking for a certain kind of result, then the kind of student that you accept is certainly going to be a factor in that. Uh, most institutions obviously would say we expect a statement of faith and we expect certain intellectual ability and so on. Uh, but today, uh, with the diversity we all experience, and in many instances, the lack of adequate background in terms of the Christian faith, instruction, maturity for many students, it's a different world. And so you have to give much more careful consideration to the kind of student you're admitting, what do they know, what kind of people are there, what is the nature of their faith, what about their vocational aspiration, and so on. Because if you know where they are, you're in a much better position than to take them where you want them to be. You ask yourself next, what does a student need? Uh, here we have these students coming to us. We know this is about what they're like. Now, what are they going to have to have in order to function as expected in ministry? And there are several ways you can go at this, but I, I think one simple taxonomy has often been referred to as knowing, being, and doing. And that's simply to, to ask these questions. What does a student need to know upon completion of the program? We expect them to know a certain amount of information. A certain amount of content has to be mastered. And are we clear on exactly what we want that to be? Next, what does a student need to know how to do? It's one thing to know certain content. It's another thing to develop certain skills and be able to do things well. You can know Bible information, uh, but if you can't do exegesis, uh, you're going to be at a loss. And we could say there are steps even beyond that in terms of the skill development. You, you have to move that into communicating the things that you have learned. Third would be this, what kind of person should the student be? In recent years in the United States, one of the things that has received much more attention than in prior years is what is often referred to as spiritual formation. And for years, there were very little attention was given to this matter. But 
the realization that students were coming from such diverse backgrounds, many um, without having the moral foundations that would have been expected, often experiencing difficulties that had not been true before, there's a realization that much more needed to be done in terms of the development of each student individually insofar as character, moral formation, spiritual formation. So it seems to me if you're, if you're going at this issue of the curriculum and the total student's development, you've got to consider all these factors. And a failure in any one of those may come back to create a deficiency that's going to reflect badly on the school. Then you, you should say finally, how should the curriculum shape the student's character or spiritual life? Which is similar to the question above. Well, we've talked about the importance of purpose. We've talked about the kind of student who comes to you, what you want to accomplish with that student. But it still leaves this question. And it seems to me this is where most of us end up, and that is, why do you want to revise the curriculum at all? I mean, really, that, that's the basic question. What makes you want to change things? You probably could think of any number of reasons. I would say um, you've got to ask yourself, is it really important? What makes it so important? Uh, how, why is this important to the student or to your graduate and to God's people in the church who are going to be ministered to? Can you really articulate that in a way that's satisfactory to you and to others? And then, of course, you get to this question, which is usually the driver, and, the, and that is, what about your current curriculum? How well does it function? What's the experience of your graduates? There usually is a problem somewhere or you wouldn't be thinking of revision. Now, it's possible that there isn't a problem, that there's something else other than a deficiency. But I think that's normally the place we would start. And so we're saying, if there are if there are things we see in our program and in our graduates that we know aren't what we would expect, then we need to address those and make some improvements. And that's what you begin to do. And that's, that's appropriate. The, the underlying question with it is, um, are, there, are there weaknesses that are going to be very difficult for you to identify? You may see some issues in terms of graduates, you may see some issues in terms of how your school is being perceived. There could be any number of things. How, how do you know you can clearly identify those so that you can really rectify them? And that's often a huge problem because you think you know what your trouble is and then later you discover you really didn't know it at all. You can ask yourself, is it meeting the need in the Christian market, whether church or other Christian organizations? And that's a pretty simple thing to, begin, to get an answer to. Are you asking reliable sources about that? Do you have some way of looking at the track record of graduates, staying in touch with them so that over a period of years, you see how well they succeed in ministry. And it seems to me every institution ought to have a way of gathering that information. Now, some of it may be anecdotal, but some of it could be very easily measurable in different ways. And you would want to find a way to do that that would benefit you. So you're asking in regard to that about your success rate and how do you determine the success of your graduates. Do you determine it by the number who become church planters, by the growth of their congregations? Do you determine it by those who go into other different vocational callings? Or 
are you sure how you are supposed to get a grip on that? How do you compare to similar schools in regard to the matter? Well, one of the things you could ask yourself is what about the hidden curriculum? Every school has a curriculum, and that's a published curriculum. And the courses are clear, the faculty is listed with all the degrees and distinguished accomplishments and the like. Everything is laid out, and yet the hidden curriculum at every school is equally powerful. Not always acknowledged, but it's, it's equally powerful. And how can you know what that hidden curriculum is? I would say one way to get a handle on this is by realizing that the, the hidden curriculum is a reflection of your institutional culture. And your institutional culture is essentially the embodiment of those values which characterize your institution as they come to expression in the daily function of the organization. It's possible that the hidden curriculum of your school adulates the person who has great knowledge and can dispense that. It's possible the hidden curriculum of your school is highly relational <clears throat> and built around an encouraging model of development. It's possible that any number of other values may come to expression in your institution and shape your students in ways you've never really thought about consciously. So all I'm saying here is there's a great deal of conversation about shaping curricula, revising curricula, what you want to get accomplished, and very often <clears throat> those efforts fail because you really haven't come to grips with the hidden curriculum. And until you do that, uh, you're not going to be as successful as you want to be. It took me a long time to realize that's the case. And I, I was involved in several different efforts at revising curriculum and all sort of interesting experiences. If you've been involved in an institutional experience of curriculum revision, you know what I mean by that. If you, if you want to move forward, what you do is develop a plan to achieve the desired result or results. That's a start. Say, so I know the purpose. Now I need to have a plan for what I want to accomplish. If our institution doesn't have a clear plan with specified objectives of what will be accomplished by this curriculum, we're not going to end up where we want to be. And then you, you look at this as an effort that will involve not only the faculty, but the board, and perhaps key leaders in your constituency going to have to be a, a more significant effort. You want those people to understand the need for this revision and be supportive of it. Only when you have some kind of consensus of that nature are you ready to move to the next step. And that next step then would be to appoint a committee that has a responsibility for revising the curriculum. You've got to give very careful attention to the composition of that committee, I can tell you. Uh, I have one friend who said he always liked to have his enemies out where he could see them. If he did that in revising a curriculum, there'd be one sure way to subvert the whole effort. Uh, you've got to have people who are going to be able to work constructively together. And they have to be committed to the objectives for that curriculum revision. They know, why do you want to revise? What do you want to accomplish? You get that set out, then you're prepared to move forward with that committee. And as you do it, 
you want to be sure that you have people on the committee who have the expertise to acknowledge and address the deficiencies or the expectations of this effort. You don't get the right people in your committee, it will be a terrible handicap. And what I'm really doing along with this, I think you can see, is, is um, I'm making you aware that curricular revision is a process. And if it's a process, you think about what is it that precipitates the awareness of a need to revise? How do you begin to see what needs to be revised for what results? How do, you be, how do you begin to get a consensus that this needs to be done and then pick the right people to get involved in doing it? So you have a whole process. And you might even, for the benefit of those who are involved, want to develop something like a flowchart that shows here's where we begin and here are the steps we move through to get where we want to be. You clarify the task. You clarify the expected outcomes or results. And you're in a position then for people to know, here's what we're trying to get accomplished. Here's the way we want it to work out. Now, we can go to work. And as you do, I would say, that one of the things that probably ought to be stressed more, from my own experience, I'd say that, is the interrelatedness and integrative nature of the curriculum. It's typically, uh, it becomes very atomistic. We have people teaching different courses, and we think a little about sequence and relationships, but it, a lot of institutions are fairly atomistic. We don't look a lot at what we're doing. We don't look over each other's shoulders, compare notes, and talk about how we can work, improve, and integrate everything. I was, um, I, I was in um, one situation where we worked very hard on teaching the languages, worked very hard on teaching Bible content, worked very hard on teaching exegesis. And we were doing all of that making progress with students, and we were working on communicating skills, on preaching and teaching, and all of the elements of doing that. We had a number of experiences where students would preach, and you would have no idea they had ever studied exegesis. I mean, it was like two different worlds. And, you're, and then you sit back and you wonder, what are we getting accomplished? I mean, why can't we do a better job than this? So, I would say, <clears throat> as you wrestle with things like this that undoubtedly you're familiar with yourself, what you want to do is be sure you clarify the task all over again and the expected outcomes. And with that, get everybody to agree on certain priorities, maybe even rank order. Say, this is the most important thing we have to accomplish. And this is what it means to accomplish it. Here's how we'll know when we get there. And here are the next few things that we, these are very important. So if you don't have some sense of priority, the important things can get lost in the mix because eventually everybody has their own interest and priorities. So you have to, inst you have to prioritize the institutions. As you do that, you keep giving attention to the process and methodology, not only of the committee's work, but of the educational experience. And, and that's part of what I'm referring to in talking about the ability to integrate everything you're learning in biblical studies with communicating, preaching, and teaching, so that there's a, a, a an appropriate kind of integration of all of this acquired knowledge and ability. How do, you, how do you work that out? Sometimes we do it well within departments and not so well within the institution. 
Uh, very often, even within departments, we don't work as much as we should to try to integrate all of the pieces so that it's one flow. And when it comes to methodology, uh, again, often uh, not enough attention is given to this. Now, I'm here giving you a session that's primarily like, an, it's like a teaching presentation. You and I both know that the, the weakest form of learning is the lecture. And yet, that's what we're most addicted to. So we should ask ourselves, what, what can we do to improve the learning experience? Well, we shouldn't rely totally on lectures. What other methodologies can be used that would be beneficial? And, and how, can we, how can we begin to implement these? And very often what you have to do is spend a lot of time teaching your teachers. That is, they need professional development or training to be able to do a better job in these areas. Sometimes they don't even see how this can happen themselves. I had one experience where I had been extremely concerned about what we were failing to accomplish in terms of personal transformation and spiritual development. And we kept doing one thing and then another thing, another thing to make an improvement, didn't get anywhere. And after a period of years, we developed a counseling program that was a clinical counseling program. And we began to see dramatic transformation of the students in that program. And so the question is, why are these students changing? And these students are not changing. What's going on? And so we began to examine that and we made a number of discoveries that we had then to try to incorporate into other aspects of the institution's instructional approach. And I may tell you about that later, if you're curious. Uh, what about technology? We live in a world in which the growth of technology has been absolutely exponential. I just looked at something the other day. IBM had five things that are going to change life dramatically in the next few years. We have to be aware of this and learn how to make use of it as effectively as possible. Well, the committee needs some guidelines, and I would say uh, one of the first is how will the outcomes be measured? Second is to realize that once you start, it's going to be political. I mean, that's why I said the committee you get is so important. And, and then, it, in spite of that, everybody has certain interests. And everybody has their own agenda. It's hard to subvert those to the interest of the group or the institution. Some people are better at that than others, and that's why you want to keep your goals, your priorities as clear as possible, and keep reminding everybody, is this going to help achieve these priority items? You want to plan how that curriculum will be presented both to the faculty and to the board once it's completed so that you'll get the best possible reception. And then you've also got to be ready to help the faculty implement this and be highly supportive of them in implementing it. It'll mean greater change for some people than others. You notice this is... Um, this print is a little heavier here. And this is, you know, there are a few things I'm saying that are really important. Like, you need to know why you're doing this and what you want to accomplish. You've got to see the process. You've got to understand it's political. And finally, maybe the most important thing I'm saying is you can do all the curriculum revision you want to do but it will ultimately be dependent on the faculty who teach it. And so you have to have the kind of faculty who align with what you're trying to accomplish or it won't happen. I have learned that one the hard way too. 
I can tell you. So, unless you get the alignment of the faculty and curriculum, the priorities of the faculty will prevail. The curriculum will not accomplish the purpose which you have intended. It will accomplish what that faculty wanted to accomplish, or individual faculty member. So you give careful attention to hiring and professional development of faculty for the purpose of achieving the desired institutional culture and goals. That's a big order. It does not happen quickly with a simple process. It's a long-term effort. All right. Evaluating your results. You've got a plan to do that regularly to see if you're getting the outcomes you want. Have criteria to help you do that. And then be prepared to measure everything for which you've specified an outcome. Determine when and how progress is going to be measured and be able to measure the difference from when the student enters to when they finish to five or ten years after. And use the results of those outcomes to help you make additional adjustments to the curriculum because it will be a continuing process. 